Hey, so I know I just made a big video analyzing and comparing two almost equally excellent things from Kaguya-sama Love is War, and there's probably at least a few of you out there who would really like me to talk about literally anything else before doubling back to it, but I kinda binged the, uh, entire manga after finishing that video, and my brain is a little stuck on Kaguya right now. The two points that stuck the hardest are its damnably infectious openings, Love Dramatic and Daddy Daddy Do. Curse you, Masayuki Suzuki, and your impossibly catchy crooning. Luckily, having binged the manga, I'm now fully equipped to break down the symbolism and foreshadowing present in both openings, though don't worry, I will be vague enough to avoid major spoilers for you anime onlys, and while I'm at it, I may as well compare them to see which is best. Gotta get you guys fighting in the comments for that sweet, sweet engagement somehow. I promise once I've shaken this show loose from my mind, I'll move on to other stuff like One Piece, Tower of God, and Beastars, and I don't want to keep you waiting any longer for that than I have to, so let's just dive into this, shall we? Allow me, Mr. The show's first opening, Love Dramatic, kicks off with a shot of a lone heart, center frame on a stark white background. Kaguya and Shirogane appear to bump into each other in front of it, both becoming flustered at the perceived closeness, before the camera swings out and up to reveal just how much distance really stands between them due to their stubborn refusal to confess, which is represented quite literally by the Kanji 4 confess on the ground between them, framed in a heart as it appears in the show's logo. That's not the only symbol to be found in this strange love void. I really hope I don't have to explain the other hearts, but there's also that weird triangle mixed in with them. That would be the Summer Triangle constellation, which Miyuki fantasized about pointing out to Kaguya on the summer mountain trip that never happened, before seducing her that way for real on the school roof without even realizing he was doing it because he's just that much of an astronomy dork. Now, there doesn't seem to be any particular symbolic significance to the weapons shown in Kaguya and Shirogane's hands when the camera pulls back down for their big face-off. Kaguya does use a blow dart at one point in the manga during the game where you can pump it as many times as you want, but you have to pump it at least once and whoever makes it burst loses, but that was an improvised paper blowpipe, nothing like the more traditional weapon she wields here. She also apparently is trained in the Naginata, but that's only mentioned offhand in the manga, so I think it's safe to say that besides perhaps the longbow from her archery club that she uses later in the OP, these weapons are meant to more broadly simplify symbolize the variety of aggressive strategies that the would-be lovers employ against each other. From the standoff, they come back together, this time back to back in the center of another heart, which transforms into the show's title card through some very effective minimalist motion graphic work. The crisscrossing lines that trace across the screen to form the letters of the title suggest, in an abstract way, the precise, logical scheming of our romantic leads, while the heartbeat line that underscores the subtitle is also used to present the rest of the OP's credits, making them feel more dynamic and cohesive. That graphical cohesion is broken somewhat by the solid yellow triangles and off-angle lines that appear behind Chica, quite intentionally, I might add, as she is the element of chaos that messes with all of those carefully laid plans. When she's done being cute, some of the supporting cast fans out behind her, and I've gotta say, the selection and arrangement of characters feels a bit random? It does make sense for Ishigami and Hayasaka to be close to her at the center, but Kay doesn't get nearly as much screen time as Kashiwagi and her boyfriend do, so why is she closer to the screen, and shouldn't Maki be behind the two of them? Why are the mass media club here at all, and not a more frequently recurring character like the principal? Is it because their spin-off Forkoma started serialization around the time the anime came out and they wanted to advertise it? I don't know, it's just a really weird lineup but it does make for a striking visual with minimal animation. That also seems to have been the idea behind the shots of Kaguya and Shirogane looking up as the other enters the club room. Not only do these shots use the same background plates cropped slightly differently between cuts, but they repeat the same animation four times over with only four frames of variation at the very end. 
Still, it is a cute, stylish way of showing how the two get flustered over each other despite their best efforts that syncs up really nicely with the music, and there is some possible foreshadowing in Shirogane reading an American newspaper. They reuse the repeated head turn animation trick just two shots later to completely different effect, highlighting the awkward tension between the two of them by showing them glancing at each other as they try to stay cool and composed weapon in hand. Traps that happen to be represented by two more entirely still images. I'm not saying any of this to knock Love Dramatic for cutting corners in its animation. If anything, I'm in awe of its efficiency. As you've probably noticed by now, it kind of defies my typical style of analysis because there aren't a lot of specific references to be found here. Most of what we see is more meant to convey the general character dynamics that drive the show in obvious but stylish ways. Chika is a wild card, while Ishigami is trapped, terrified in Shirogane and Kaguya's game. In the beginning, our heroes were distant and nervous of each other, but by the midpoint, they've turned things around and started to grow both closer and bolder. Chika is adorable, but fucking watch out because she's also a human hand grenade. It's all pretty surface level stuff, but it syncs nicely with the music and it looks really cool, animated or not. And to be fair, this OP's tone and style is a lot more important to it than any symbolic substance. You could argue that its style is its substance, actually. Between the abstract environments, the stark interplay of light and shadow, the guns and explosions, and the intense psychedelic imagery that overtakes the opening's climax, it's clear that they were trying to evoke the feeling of a Bond title sequence here. A few shots are lifted almost directly from Skyfall, albeit with slight twists to better suit the comedy's tone. It's beyond impressive that they managed to pay such effective homage while still giving the opening a distinct Kaguya-sama feel, all using a fraction of the hand-drawn animation frames and backgrounds that would normally be required to make an OP this visually dynamic. And the Bond style isn't just an excuse to make something flashy without taxing the animators, it's a perfect way of conveying what Kaguya is all about. It's a comedy that captures the self-conscious tension and competition of real high school romance by filtering the fake tropes normally used to portray it in fiction through a lens of hilariously convoluted spy movie intrigue. Despite not showing us many specific details about the show's story, Love Dramatic manages to capture exactly how it feels to watch Kaguya and exactly what makes it so fun in just a minute and 30 seconds. In that respect, it's one of the best anime openings I've ever seen, and I suspect that it alone convinced a fair number of people to pick the series up. If that's true, then the more lavishly produced second OP likely owes its existence to the success its more humble older sister brought on, but I'm getting a bit ahead of myself because there are a few symbolic loose ends left to tie up in Love Dramatic. The color-shifted doubles that emerge from Kaguya and the President during the big psychedelic breakdown of the OP may just be another cost-saving measure, a way to create the fluid motion necessary for the kaleidoscope effect to work with only a handful of frames for each weapon pose, but given the series' obsession with Jungian psychology, they could also be taken to represent the different personas that they use to appeal to each other. That also tracks with what we see at the OP's conclusion, where Kaguya and Shirogane's vast love for each other is literally hidden in their shadows, along with the guns they use to blow up the whole dang school. And if their pulling of those triggers is meant to represent their inevitable confessions in some abstract way, then that also also makes sense of what we see in the aftermath of those explosions. In the end card of this opening, we see that the symbol of their love has literally cracked the foundations of the school, and by proxy the upper crust society to whom it caters, and discarded on either side of it, we see Shirogane's presidential golden cord and the ribbon with which Kaguya ties up her hair. These accessories are the centerpieces of the personas they've crafted to attract each other. Shirogane, the confident, ever-capable genius, and Kaguya, the sweet, kind, friendly schoolgirl. To have the relationship both want, they both need to cast these masks aside and face each other as they really are, show each other their weaknesses. This is a clever and subtle way of foreshadowing where the story is going. 
And if you like that, then you are going to love Daddy Daddy Do, because its foreshadowing is even further reaching, even more specific, and even more subtly disguised. Though maybe that's not the best point to segue on, since the first shot of the OP is pretty direct in what it's referencing. The only time we see Shinomiya actually doing archery in the manga is when her mass media club fangirls come to interview her before the Shuchin Culture Festival. In that scene, she explains how she became such a successful archer. One time in middle school, she happened to get a lucky bullseye, and she's just been repeating that exact motion ever since. It's an apt metaphor for how Kaguya got through life before meeting the president. Most things came naturally to her or were straight up handed to her, so long as she followed the motions she was taught. But as we see when the arrow reaches its target, that approach will not work on Shirogane. To reach him, she needs to step outside her comfort zone and try something new. The interceding shots of the arrow traveling, meanwhile, are a very creative way of introducing the supporting cast while demonstrating how they relate to this relationship. Happy-go-lucky Chika, for instance, doesn't notice it when it's right in front of her and is straight up shocked when it blows past her. We don't really see much of Ishigami's reaction, but it does seem to be more muted than Chika's, which makes sense given that he caught on to Kaguya's crush ages ago. The arrow passing does pull his sullen gaze up from the ground, however, which could reflect how Kaguya, in finding the confidence to pursue Shirogane, helps Ishigami reclaim his confidence and move toward his own romantic goals later in the series. Next, the arrow interrupts Kashiwagi and her boyfriend in the middle of a lewd public display that, knowing them, was about to lead to something a heck of a lot lewder. Their reaction is the most panicked out of everyone, understandably so, since the arrow did nearly kill them, in much the same way that the sappy notion of Kaguya's true love that it represents almost made Kashiwagi cringe to death. The adorably innocent and oblivious Miko Ino is the only character unfazed by the arrow. Meanwhile, her best friend Osaragi, a character with a <clears throat> keen interest in the relationships of her fellow classmates, is the only one who turns her head to trace the arrow's path. Last, but certainly not least, Ai Hayasaka isn't even in the same room as the arrow, but she's so keenly attuned to Kaguya's feelings that she notices it nonetheless. When the arrow at last reaches Shirogane, he stares straight at it, fully prepared to face Kaguya's feelings head on, but only if she comes to him. These distant attacks just won't break his shield. The title card that transitions out of that shield suggests that may yet happen. A question mark pops up at the end of the Japanese title, Kaguya Wants to Be Confessed To? Hinting at her wavering conviction that Shirogane must be the one who confesses to her. The subtitle, The Genius's War of Hearts and Brains, is crossed out entirely, reflecting that this season puts their battles on the back burner, for the most part. Meanwhile, on the front burner, Kaguya is busy frying up an egg roll, something she's not particularly practiced at, judging by the look of nervous concentration on her face, though thankfully she has the domestic ninja Hayasaka there to guide her through it. A very fancy bento lies waiting for that egg roll to be placed in it, in contrast to the more basic ingredients in the lunchbox Shirogane is just finishing up. We cut to that with a very stylish split-screen effect, and I love how Shirogane's hands also brush aside the character designer and animation director credits when the split-screen rolls over. There's some solid credit integration throughout this whole opening, though that's not the only thing that's impressive about this shot. The animation of the entire shot, from the exaggerated wobbling of the octopus weenie to the flexing of Shirogane's fingers as he places the bento lid, is ridiculously, almost unnecessarily good. Both elements could have just been motion tweened in, and I doubt anyone would have complained, yet animator Kazutoshi Makino worked hard to make this small moment feel realistic and weighty. And that level of animated fidelity extends out over basically the entire OP, from the tensing fingers and rustling feathers animated by Hiroyuki Takashima as Kaguya draws back her bow, all the way up to Shirogane's hilarious full-body cringe animated by Osamu Sakata at the end. Every shot, every movement is refined and fluid, bold visual gags and subtle character acting alike. It's as though the show's small animation staff is flexing throughout the whole thing, showing what they can do when their skills are totally uncompromised. 
And while it may not be as stylistically dramatic as the first opening, it's every bit as fun to watch, if not more. It's definitely better at illustrating the specifics of the show's character dynamics. The way Shirogane, apron draped over that uniform he almost never takes off, turns to offer his sister a cutely wrapped lunchbox, wordlessly informs us of the almost motherly role he's taken in their home. And her cold, stiff rejection of that lovingly prepared meal tells us exactly what the rebellious middle schooler thinks of that status quo. It's a cute character beat, but not quite as cute is watching Kaguya gently fumble her way through cutting that egg into a heart shape for the president, animated by Hanoka Yokoyama. The jump cut and shifts in lighting in this shot imply this takes some time, and that Kaguya spends some time after simply staring at her handiwork before working up the resolve to place it in her traditional lacquered bento box and close the lid. All while the King of Love Songs reflects her feelings by crooning in the background that he knows he shouldn't chase you, but he just can't help it. On top of painting a picture of who Kaguya and the President are and how they feel about each other, these intercut scenes between her full industrial kitchen and his teeny apartment throw the divisions in class and wealth that stand between them into stark contrast. And that's further highlighted by their different modes of transportation. Shirogane rides to school on on a simple bike with a basket in the front and rack at the back that clearly serves a dual purpose of ferrying groceries back to his humble home. Meanwhile, Shinomiya zips by him in a pricey black sedan. However, in that brief moment where their paths intersect, all of those differences fall away, along with the masks that Suzuki is singing about discarding, and all that's left is the love in Shinomiya's eyes and Shirogane's recognition of it. A moment that wouldn't work at all without that smooth, subtle animation I mentioned, and that would feel out of place if the rest of the opening didn't keep it up. The split-screen shot of Kaguya and Shirogane climbing the stairs as Suzuki declares this isn't a game anymore makes for a pretty nifty visual, and the way they flip and mirror the producer credits to match each cut is an especially neat touch. But beyond simply looking cool, the visual of the pair moving upward to their goal in parallel in a way that happens to temporarily pull them apart is very evocative of the rising action in the manga's culture festival. Of a lark. And the shot of a flock of doves, globally recognized symbols of peace, or in Japanese tradition specifically, the end of a war, ascending past the school roof is particularly evocative of that arc's climax. If you've read it yourself, or watched it depending on when you're watching this, you'll probably know what I'm talking about. And you'll know that Kaguya hiding a heart shape in a gift for the president with Hayasaka's help further supports my interpretation that everything from the start of the OP up to this shot of the sky is a metaphor for that arc. Now, at the season's current pacing, it doesn't seem like it'll reach the culture festival before it ends. I expect it'll cap off at some point after the sports festival, but if... Just to speculate, A1 Pictures were planning to, say, cover that arc in an interseasonal movie, it would make a lot of sense for them to foreshadow it here. That said, in the last 30 seconds of the OP, the metaphor does kinda break down, and I think that final stretch is meant to more broadly represent the comedic character dynamics of the season as a whole through its punchline on the setup of the bentos. The OP signals this shift from heartfelt romance to full-on farce by cutting back to the characters who trigger that same shift within the show itself. Well, Ishigami and Miko are mostly sensible on their own, but together, especially in a pack led by the human hand grenade herself in full love detective mode, they are a force of chaos to be feared. I absolutely adore the walk cycle Takashi Tori gave this motley crew for their march toward the student council room. It's delightfully bouncy and cartoony, and on the subject of bouncy things, it's clever how the splash of color around Chika's head, created by her hair and hat, draws your eye to her within the shot composition, so you're more likely to spot the animation of her eyes tracing the trail of hearts up to the club room door. Unfortunately for the people behind that door, the heart barrier that pops up in front of it isn't Chika proof, and the bemused smile we see on her face as the group pauses before it says she she's itching to barge in there and cause problems. Ishigami behind her looks characteristically worried about the whole thing, while the naive bewilderment on Miko's face tells us she has no idea what she's in for in there. Yet. 
Osaragi in the back is inscrutable as usual, though those raised eyebrows indicate she suspects something entertaining is up. And she's right. Inside the room, a comedy of errors and misunderstandings quite typical of the show is about to unfold. Kaguya sits nervously poking at her food, staring at the president as she tries to work up the nerve to offer it to him. When this catches his attention, she quickly turns away, making the self-conscious president worry he's offended her in some way. While he's fretting in the background, the blushing idiot persona Bakaguya takes over and screws up the courage to stand up and face him. She tips the bento forward to show him the heart, and also to let animator Reina Kawasaki show off her talents with a seriously impressive high-detail faux 3D effect, but this being Bakaguya, she's so focused on her hands and maintaining her composure that she ends up tripping over her own feet in the process. She reacts to this with panicked embarrassment. Shirogane looks seriously worried for her safety, and in the doorway, the gang of idiots pops up to react as well. Ishigami shows genuine, if slightly condescending, concern as well, while Miko is simply surprised by the moment of foolishness. Osaragi, quickest to catch on, adjusts her glasses with a knowing smile, while the so-called love detective completely misses the obvious rom-com moment happening before her as her eyes are drawn to a sudden free snack. This moment of on-brand idiocy is accentuated by the light that pops up above Chika's head, which takes the form of her trademark ribbon for a single frame before bursting into Kira Kira sparkles. The eggs soar majestically through the club room as Kaguya adorably panics and the president is overtaken with slow motion shock, but suddenly Chika uses her powers as a half-human Looney Tune to teleport between them and snatch the snack from the air with impeccable comic timing. The laughs continue as everyone reacts in stunned silence to her oblivious gluttony, and the equally oblivious principal contemplates taking a stroll to catch a Pikachu, and then we're treated to one more gag when we return to the student council room. Shirogane, unaware of the true significance of what Chika just ate, bluntly offers Kaguya some of his egg rolls, along with maybe an octopus weenie or two, something that of course makes her unbearably happy and flustered. In an attempt to calm down, she places her right hand on her left cheek, a ritual she develops with Hayasaka in Chapter 81 of the manga to counter her increasingly uncontrollable feelings for the president, but in the process she ends up overcorrecting and taking on her Ice Queen glare. With that look in her eyes, her genuine compliment on how cute the weenies are takes on an air of sinister condescension, and it's Shirogane's defeat as embarrassment over his pathetic commoner's lunch racks his entire body. The camera then pulls out of the club room and tilts up toward the sky, which has been used throughout this OP as a symbol of the couple's bright but still very distant romantic future. This is, in effect, a full-blown bonus Kaguya-sama skit, featuring the entire main cast with both jokes and character psychology conveyed entirely wordlessly through the power of animation. And all of it's crammed into the space of just 30 seconds, plus a minute of build-up. This opening demonstrates not just how talented the animation team behind this show, led by Rakugo Shinju director Mamoru Hatakeyama, really is, but also how thoroughly they understand the source material. Enough to craft an authentic-feeling Kaguya-sama story in a medium almost wholly divorced from the static, dialogue-driven manga. This OP is a true work of art, but then so is Love Dramatic in its own way, and I do think that out of the two, the first opening does a far better job of conveying the feel of the series to a brand new viewer. Daddy Daddy Do, in contrast, seems to be aimed more at existing fans, providing fan service in the form of deeper cut references and heavier foreshadowing, while assuring returning viewers that the things they loved about the first season are back and better than ever. In other words, one is a perfect opening for the show's first season, while the other is a perfect opening for its second. They both accomplish what they set out to do marvelously, and while I personally prefer the more nuanced storytelling and polished presentation of the second opening, not to mention its tighter credit integration, comparing the two of them directly is kind of a Chica's errand. So I guess the final joke of both Daddy Daddy Do and Love Dramatic is on me 
for using that comparison as a framing device for this video in the first place. Still, a debate being pointless has never stopped the internet before, and I do really need that engagement, you guys, so please use my indecisive final answer to this question as an excuse to argue endlessly about it down in the comments. And if you're looking for some more great anime content to watch, you should check out the hilarious video about Tokyo Mew Mew that Yazzie just put up on her channel, Best Girls Basement. With that said, I'm Jeff Thu, professional shitbag, signing out of mine.